I'm working and have worked for 30 years with people who manage the black budget of the United States, who manage the CIA and the Department of Defense. They have been denied access to these projects, and yet we can prove they exist. The way it will, John. Guys, what's up? We are back with a very special guest today, Dr. Stephen Greer, who is the founder of the Disclosure Project, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, CSETI, uh, the Orion Project, and Serious Technology Advanced Research. Uh, he is the father of Disclosure Movement. He presided over the groundbreaking National Press Club Disclosure event in May of 2001. Uh, he has also worked for 17 years to bring together the scientists, inventors, and leaders in society to advance new clean technology energy systems. A lifetime member of Alpha Omega Alpha, the nation's most prestigious medical honor society, Dr. Greer has now retired as an emergency physician to work on all of the projects that I just mentioned. So Dr. Greer, thank you for being here. How's Great. it going? Great, glad to be here with you. Yes, quite the bio, uh, of course, as well. And uh, it's always cool to have people that have lived such you know interesting lives and, and, and dug into this stuff. So I, I wanna get straight into it. Um, you, were a, you were a doctor, you are a doctor, right. let's put it that way. And um, you were working in the, the uh, emergency ward. I'm I'm assuming. And uh, how do we get here? Because uh, this is a different. Yeah, world. it's so very different. from. Well, I, I tell people now I'm, I'm dealing with real trauma. Uh, I'm an emergency trauma guy. Um, but it was funny when one of my early meetings when I was briefing the director of the CIA for, for President Clinton, I said, look, I'm an emergency doctor and I know an emergency when I see one. Um, we're in a constitutional emergency. We're in a global climate emergency, we're in a geopolitical emergency, uh, even more so now than it was uh, almost, uh, what, 29 years ago when I said that to, to uh, the CI director. And I'm referring to the fact that we have 75 years of illegal projects in the United States and elsewhere dealing with what the public call UFOs, extraterrestrial intelligence, things of this sort. And I discovered this quite accidentally. Uh, I was young guy, maybe eight or nine, saw one of these UFOs uh, where I grew up in North Carolina in Charlotte, broad daylight. My twin sister saw it and some friends in the neighborhood. Uh, it sort of appeared and then disappeared. It didn't fly in like an aircraft. And we knew what we'd seen. It was one o'clock in the afternoon or something. It was, it was broad daylight. And so it ignited a lifelong interest in this. So I started studying it. And, uh, and then, you know, some years later, I uh, had a near-death experience when I was 17. I was this kind of jock guy, and I ignored an injury on my leg, and it got infected. And next thing you know, I'm so sick, um, I died. I was living by myself. I had my own apartment in high school. We were too poor to have doctors in my family back then. And so <clears throat> that was that, and I thought, oh, boy, here we go. But I had this beautiful experience of sort of cosmic consciousness. It's hard to explain um, other than to say that it's when your your own individual mind merges with the unbounded mind of the cosmos and you have this sort of samadhi but fully awake and so that taught me that there was more to this universe than i had been taught i was raised a very devout atheist we always joked um we didn't believe in anything so I, this sort of opened the whole universe to me and i started to learn to meditate so i took a meditation course and then six months after this near-death experience, I'm up meditating on a mountain in North Carolina when I was first year of college, I was 18. And I see this same spacecraft that I saw when I was um, eight or nine. And now this is 1973 up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And um, okay. I saw it, it was before sunset and it was exactly the same craft. I just acknowledged it and it vanished and I meditated. And when I sort of did this deep meditation at the end of which uh, I was in that same state of consciousness that I experienced when I had died, it was this beautiful state of kind of oneness with cosmos and all that there is beautiful. And I then realized there was a glow over the crest of the hill. And then there was this little uh, creature or, or uh, upright. I thought it was a deer on its hind legs, beautiful eyes sure. and came over and touched me on my right shoulder. And uh, I sort of like vanished, uh, dematerialized for several hours. And we 
I had an, I had an experience where I began to communicate with the ETs. These were extraterrestrials, definitely. And we sort of created this concept that we can communicate with each other using consciousness, mind, but very specifically. And some hours later, I come back onto the mountain about 100, 200 yards from where I left and hike down the mountain into town. And I started practicing this. We call it the CE5 contact. There's an app for it. You can be trained to do this on an app. It's called CE5 contact. And it was an amazing experience. And so that really launched me on this path. But, you know, some years passed. I didn't know what the heck am I going to do with this? And I, you know, go into medical school and become a doctor and four daughters and doing the, you know, everything that one quote normally does. <laughs> and, uh, and then I had another contact experience in 1990. It basically was quite clear to me I was supposed to lean into this issue and that the time was right for me to do it. So I formed the CE5 contact uh, program and that's just how we started. But by 1992, we had this event happen in Florida where we were out on a beach. It's a really funny video because you, it's bad quality, but there were four ET craft that materialized, 60 people. But there was a guy there in a the video going, holy damn hot shit. He says, Southern dude from Louisiana. It's hilarious. And, um, you know, we had a couple of Air Force colonels with me and some other people interested in what we were attempting to do to make contact with these civilizations. And we did. But it ended up on the front page of the Pensacola paper the next day. And that unleashed the entire intelligence community in the United States onto me because they basically said the head of army intelligence says, what the F are you doing? I said, well, you can guys do, this is what we're doing. And if you don't like it, you can go pound salt. I mean, this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm nice until I'm not nice. I'm going to run you over. But, uh, <laughs> but this guy got all of my grill, you know, this and that and threatening me and all this stuff. I said, you know, I'm not afraid of you, bud. I said, I'm not rich, but I'm a doctor. I don't need your money. I'm not afraid of you. I died when I was 17. I know there is no death. I'm a spirit warrior that way. And number three, you're not going to trick me about what this is. I know what you guys are doing. And I know what the ETs are about. And by the way, the ETs are completely non-hostile, non-violent. Um, all the horrible things, all, all the horrible things you hear. Well, those are all okay. CIA counterintelligence projects, the abductions, the mutilations, all that junk. But this ended up opening up some guys, I call them the white hats at the CIA and Pentagon who reached out to me and said, look, we really need help with something. And that is this, these projects are not known by the president and the CIA director. And I thought this was a joke. So I get brought up here to Washington to meet and brief for about three hours to the head of the CIA, which I thought this is ridiculous. A doctor in North Carolina is being involved in something like this because they knew I understood what was going on, but the director of the CIA and the president had been told, we're not going to tell you anything. They basically had been flipped off. That's a true story. Now, so that opened up this entire process where I realized there is a very um, shadowy governmental entity that runs these projects that is a criminal enterprise. And I say that very specifically. It is global, it's criminal, and it runs outside the Constitution. I mean, I, I'm working and have worked for 30 years with people who manage the black budget of the United States, who manage the CIA and the Department of Defense. They have been denied access to these projects, and yet we can prove they exist. So I began to gather together whistleblowers. So originally I had like a, you know, a dozen of them. Then we had like a hundred. Now I've debriefed and met with about 980 or more military, intelligence, corporate whistleblowers. Uh, and, and we know where everything is now. I mean, we, we know where the everything is that's operating and what they have. What the, the big surprise came when I realized that a great many of these sightings are actually covert man-made UFOs. They look like UFOs, but they're ours. And this is something that most people in government, I'm here in Washington right now, I'm looking at the White House and the, and the Washington Monument right here to my right. Most people in, in government have no idea what's going on with this stuff. Everyone thinks, oh, well, he's the president or he's the senator from whatever. And, and no, forget it. They're not told anything. And so that's very dangerous because 
what they're keeping secret for, for, for starters is that they're trying to put information out to the public that's totally false to lay the foundation for conflict and weapons in space. Very dangerous game being played. Much more dangerous than even the standoff with Russia and Ukraine, I can assure you. Orders of magnitude worse than that. And the other thing are the solutions to the environment and poverty. So if you if you if you just click on you know any of the big news reports about our jets chasing these UAPs UFOs, they're not moving uh, with rockets and jets. It's field propulsion, which means it's all electromagnetic. There's no payload, not nuclear, and it's the kind of stuff that Tesla began to discover in the early 20th century about energy coming from this infinite field, what's called the zero point energy field now. Now, that means that your house, my house, your car, my car, the factory down the road, all of it could be run at zero energy costs once you have the device built, like a heat pump or something would look like, and there'd be no pollution. And within 20 years, there would be no poverty on earth, none. Now, why isn't that a good thing? Because the people who are sitting on top, though I call them the industrial fascists, that are sitting on top of the petrodollar system and oil and all this, that's over $900 trillion that they're protecting. This is big money. This is not, you know, even the federal debt here in the United States is only, after our 200-year history, $30 trillion. We're talking 30 times that in active resources that these guys have. And these technologies would put an end to all of that. So if you're at the top of the pyramid in terms of money and power, disclosing this is not a good thing. If you're an every guy, you know, ordinary guy like me or you, it is a great thing for us and our children and my 11 grandchildren. Um, interestingly, when I started this project, my kids were the ages of my grandkids now. But so here we are. So that's just sort of a quick yeah. overview of kind of what we're working on. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and and you mentioned something that I, I, I always have a curiosity on, and also that I'm sure people who are new to this subject mm -hmm. are going to have a curiosity on. You mentioned that, obviously, the president isn't debriefed on this stuff, and many people in government are essentially not. Yeah, they're not. There's a select few, let's say, uh, or, the, or they're not. How are they choosing, how is this continuing is it through a nep nepotism is it through who, who gets into the club who is the club because if you even know people who are, are dealing with the black budget you know and, and, and i understand we need a black budget okay we're fighting just like you said but okay we got to deal with some stuff in russia and ukraine and and etc so there is a black budget to, to to further you know military advancement and if it's outside of that mm -hmm. who are they how how can a system like this run because that's probably the first thing people will go to when they deal with even if there are ufos or aliens or any sort of mm -hmm. you know uh, vehicles that we can't explain how well you know we have a, a a documentary it's had about 750 million people see it it's on amazon prime and tubi and pluto and I, I don't know around the world various sites called unacknowledged and the reason i called it unacknowledged is that it's the first word in a, in a in a type of project called an unacknowledged special access project and those unacknowledged special access projects are very deep black. They're not acknowledged to anyone, not in them. Now, there are some USAPs, we call them, that are overseen and are known by the people in the government who should know. But this one is the granddaddy that they cannot penetrate. Now, the way that happened is between 1945 at the end of World War II and, and 1960, the group studying this issue where they, they had downed and retrieved ET vehicles not just Roswell, but a whole bunch of, of situations. And we were using electromagnetic weapons. This program, R&D, research and development on this science and technology went deep black, beyond black, because they didn't want anyone to know we had it. Um, and they began to then deceive the president. The president at that time, in the 50s, was Eisenhower. And Dwight Eisenhower, when he left office, said, beware the military industrial complex. He's talking about this hybrid, very fascist in mixture of, of industrial and militarists who have went off the reservation and began to lie to him. And he was betrayed. I know people who knew, knew Ike, uh, President Eisenhower, um, 
who testified that he was very much had been betrayed. And he was a five star general, by the way, a World War II hero. But that didn't matter. So and then from there, it did become very familial, corporate um, and also, I have to say, corruption. Now, uh, this is a shocking statement. But in 1992, the head of Army Intelligence personally offered me two billion dollars. And that was a lot of money back then. It's a lot now if I would be quiet yeah. and join his board. And he was on this <clears throat> committee. We call it the Majority Intelligence Committee, MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C. I have documents, top secret documents that name them. And I know who they are. I know a number of them. You know, Admiral Bobby Ray right. Inman, Dick Cheney. There are a whole bunch of guys who've been on this. A Papa Bush, the Bush Sr. was on it, not W. Um, he was not entrusted with it. But, um, you know, I, I'm the Prince of Liechtenstein that I've met with, I, I've, there are certain people who I've met with who are on it. They try to recruit people and they will threaten you, kill you if they have to, or buy you off. Now, in my case, they weren't able to do any of those, but it was attempted. Assassination attempt, definitely. Um, and this bribe, I was so shocked. I said, how do you have $2 billion? They said, well, when the Soviet Union fell apart, they had confiscated a bunch of money and assets in Eastern Europe. And it was part of this corrupt, you know, seizure of all these assets. And they, they said, well, we'll just give you that. You can do what you want with it. And I'm kidding. Now, this is how rotten. So later, about a year later, I met with a man who was on this board at the Wrigley Mansion in Phoenix. And he, he turns to me towards the end of the meeting. He says, you know, we've given over 10,000 people at least $10 million or more to secure their cooperation with this secrecy and this program. I said, yeah, I know. I was offered $2 billion. So, you know, this is the mano a mano you deal with when you're dealing with probably the most ruthless mafia, an organized crime syndicate in the world. So I, I think that, unfortunately, that is the truth. It sounds like a really bad conspiracy novel. Um, it happens to be the way the world runs, my friend. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we have our elected officials. That's sort of like the Truman Show. They want everyone to think this is where it's happening. And it's really happening over here. Now, it takes it takes government investigators two or three years and when they're looking into this subject to realize every word I just told you is true. And then eventually they'll turn to me and say, Dr. Greer, we need you to come in and kind of guide us through this situation. So that's why I have a place here in Washington, um, because that's what I have to do kind of off the record. But um, I, I'll just say generally, that's what I have to do. It's very stressful. I mean, these are the men and women who've had to look into this, who get blocked, who, who are supposed to be looking over the security of the United States and the world. And the same is true, by the way, in the United Kingdom and Australia. I've met with the ministers of defense of Canada, uh, United Kingdom, Australia. They didn't even know where the washrooms were in the mm. deep underground military bases running these projects. So <clears throat> then... Uh, I've got one thing uh, before I go on because I'm, I'm curious about this and you've mentioned this numerous times. I've seen some, some videos about the potential of obviously a false flag attack uh, or there, if not even a false flag attack, at least them mm -hmm. presenting the idea that these UFOs, UAPs are a threat sure. uh, to us. And then, then of course, utilizing it's, it's an old trick, right? I mean, I think that we, we now live in a, uh, the days and you've been around for some time and you've seen that the, mm -hmm. the changes probably happen throughout uh, you know, the masses were a bit suspect now. And, and right. to be honest, I mean, as, as a guy who is clearly not as deeply involved as you, it's hilarious to me to, to, to finally see on. I remember the 90s. Like, you know, I was born in 1985. Right. I remember the 90s. There was there's no there's no UFO on, on CNN uh, in, in the 90s. All of a sudden we get to 2020, 2021. And then all of a sudden they go, hey, yeah, by the way, mm -hmm. these are real. We don't know what they are, but these are real. And the, 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 the videos are from forever ago. So uh, the question to me isn't why uh, is this real or what's going on? Uh, that it just seems why now? What's the plan? And, and, and what can you say about this potential for a false flag attack that you've spoken on? Yeah, it's a great question. And by the way, about uh, eight or nine months ago, uh, we released a documentary called The Cosmic Hoax. And it's on blockchain and sites all over and also on our my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com uh, slash Dr. Stephen Greer 55. Uh, you can put a link up, but and you can we will definitely free. link to it. Yeah. The reason we did that, we did it as an emergency release because after unacknowledged hit 700 
million plus people to see who saw it. They trotted out these uh, professional liars, such as Luis Elizondo and others, and they were all over the news with this footage of one of these UAPs being chased. Now, I knew that that footage, if you Google it, look at it, it's all on CBS, CNN, Fox, all, they're all on BBC, every outlet in the world. That's one of ours. That was a Lockheed Martin device that was tricking our, our flyboys, our jet pilots. And this is done all the time, but they did it in a classified area or a sensitive area of operations off the coast of San Diego so that it would look like a threat. So now, of course, if you're on the Senate Intelligence Committee and Armed Services, and you don't know anything about this subject and you this breaks into the news and it looks like we have a invasion or a uh, penetration of classified airspace or something uh, and over sensitive air bases. They're going to go, what is this? And so they're going, is it Chinese? Is it Russian? Is it this? I'm going, uh, it's coming out of the Lockheed Skunk Works in an underground facility out here in the high desert of California. Um, and it's ours. It's not, those weren't even extraterrestrial. So these professionally trained disinformation agents like Elizondo and others, all of a sudden on all the networks telling three provable, damnable lies. One, they're a threat to our national security. No. The actual ETs aren't, but I'll tell you who is. This covert group, they're a threat to world security and national security. Number two, that we don't know what they are. Big lie. These covert programs know that the ones that they have reverse engineered from ET materials, they know they have them. And the ones that are actually ET, they, they have them too. I mean, they have ones that they have downed. I just interviewed a man this weekend who was on a retrieval team, not recently, on a downed uh, one of these. Uh, very bad situation. And so th so they do know. And then the, the, the other big lie is that um, we couldn't possibly have anything that flies like this. Well, I have an aerospace historian that has 200,000 pages of documents about these anti-gravity so-called devices we've been building prototypes for since the mid-50s. One of my top secret scientists who, who was the top scientist at the Naval Research Labs here, which Thomas Edison founded and is the largest uh, defense laboratory in the United States, he was in the what they call the vault and saw a, the paperwork that in October of 1954, we had mastered, quote, gravity control with these electromagnetic field propulsion systems. The thing about that, we haven't needed jets, rockets. Hey, Elon Musk, you don't need SpaceX um, or any of that since the, the year before I was born and I'm 66. So, uh -huh. you know, we're talking two thirds of a century that we've been destroying the stratosphere, the, the biosphere, the air, the water, soiling our nest, as it were, as a species unnecessarily. Now you talk about a crime against the earth and humanity. This is the big one. So I think that uh, unfortunately, as the media is spoon fed false stories, they just run with them. I mean, they're basically, you know, the, 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 one of the big media people in New York in the 90s said basically, and he was very good friends with Mike Wallace at 60 Minutes. He was on the board of Time Life, uh, his name was Schwartz. And I'm sitting at this place in New York City doing a meeting. And he says, you know, we've become scribes taking dictation from the right hand of the king. Basically, we become, so we just take dictation from whatever they tell us. Sure. And, and I said, yeah, I know. I mean, it's just it's a charade. Uh, the whole idea of a free press, forget about it. Um, if you started, to, if you, if I've been on live shows with 22 million people listening. When I start to get into the actual truth about this, the satellite and link goes down. They pull a plug <laughs> on it. Cut you off. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and this is where, you know, another naivete of the public, those of us who live in allegedly the democratic free West. I'm going, yeah, to a point, but on the really big stuff, we're no more free on that than, and certainly the internet isn't. I mean, the big platforms, shadow ban me, all this stuff, um, right. are no more free than if you were in China or Russia um, mm -hmm. or Saudi Arabia. So, uh, you know, on, on this matter. So the only thing the public hears is, is the party line coming from the, the foxes in the hen house. The people who are there, you know, deceiving. In fact, as soon as these guys emerged on the public stage with a boy, I, a young man I had mentored. He was the lead guy in Blink-182, Tom DeLong. And that 
and I saw they had pulled him into this little click and filled him with all kinds of false information. And what happened is that they used him and access into the media to send this disinformation bomb. And what they're preparing for, they want people to think there is a threat out there. I mean, I'm people in government. And they convinced both Trump and Pence that the, the ETs were a threat. And we ended up with the Space Force. And I was through, trying to do an intervention on that towards the end of his term when, of course, all that craziness happened and he lost. Yeah. But <laughs> the point is, you know, this is the game that's been played for 70 years, um, certainly since the mid 50s, early 60s, um, maybe 65 years. And I, I tell people, there is no threat from outer space. The threat is from within. It's from within these unacknowledged projects. People should see this documentary. It sort of takes you for an hour and 45 minutes on a tour of, of the history and what we've been doing. But um, I think that's why, you know, I've been trying to put everything out there, just open source. Like you get on my YouTube channel, there are hundreds of videos with people yeah. who are, have clearances who are speaking openly with their name, rank, and serial number. Um, et cetera. And I, I encourage people, you know, if they're interested in this is actually look at the source material, not me. I mean, I'm, I'm a retired emergency doctor now, but the people I've been able to put under our shelter and our protection and move them forward. And we do protect them, you know, so. and that's, that's been one of the most interesting things. Uh, so obviously we'll link to, to everything, uh, that we've already spoken about and to your channel. Mm -hmm down below. But uh, one of the most interesting things when you do have a browse uh, on your channel is the integrity of the witnesses, the people, how high up they are within certain, uh, whether it's military or in the private side. And uh, you just get, you know, it's just a camera and a story. And, and obviously, you know, you can take one maybe uh, a, a, and say, okay, I, I don't know when this, the, when one after another, after another, after another, after Hundreds. another of people who... Yeah. Really, you, you can't quite find the motivation. It seems like the, you know, uh, it, it seems clear that they're, they're losing more by speaking out than they would be to just shut up and just go about their life. Um, I don't know what exactly they're all gaining from it. And it's clear that they're not just, you know, uh, you're, they're not fame seeking. So no, no, it, it is fascinating. Real, these are the real deal yeah. and they're heroic to come forward. And I'm putting out a call right now. Uh, because mm -hmm. of something we're doing here in Washington for more of them to step forward. Uh, we have a door that's opening, that's open. Um, we have the access to get the people who need to know about this back in charge. Uh, and we need people who have been in these projects to contact us at our website, uh, seriousdisclosure.com, S-A-R-I-U-S, disclosure.com, because we are um, wanting to start another whole a big push of, of bringing people forward because we have gotten assurances that these people be number one, personally protected. Number two, they will have immunity from prosecution if they had been involved in something shady. Mm -hmm. And number three, that we can uh, protect their pensions if that's involved. Because most of the men that I've dealt with who have been very deep in these projects are scared for their lives and they're scared that they're going to lose their pensions. In fact, they sign documents saying, that lethal force can be used against them and that they can lose their pensions and et cetera and so on. So, and I know them personally and it, it's serious stuff. This is not a, you know, sort of a movie on Netflix. This is a, this is our life. And these are these men's and their families' lives. And, um, you know, in fact, you know, it, it's a very big problem, but now we have a mechanism in place to bring those people in out of the cold and let them tell the truth at least to the people who are the key investigators that are in the government who are trying to get to the bottom of this because they realized that the nonsense that they were being told by these other charlatans just wasn't true. And that now they're going to have to pivot to doing another way of finding out what it is. And that's where the disclosure project that I head up is, is taking the lead on. And uh, I'm, I'm curious too, as well, because I mean, we mentioned all these people that you have there. I, <clears throat> I've personally never heard you uh, comment on, so one of the most, one of the cases that breached, let's say mainstream society, I must've been a year or two years ago, something like this is, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bob Lazar story, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, for those who don't know as best as I could equate it, he's, it's, is a man who, 
uh, purports to have worked on special access project, uh, you know, crafts, uh, reverse engineering alien crafts. He is a physicist. There's all sorts of stuff involved. It's a very fascinating story. Uh, is is he one of the people that you consider a credible resource for all this? He's a person who, by the way, seems to not really want any sort of. Where do you stand on that? I don't think I've ever heard you ever speak about Bob Lazar. Oh no, I know him. Um, he you know, okay. He did the disclosure project, and uh, okay. he, he was a young man who was only had a glimpse for a very short amount of time. I, I think what I would be very careful about, and this is true of all these uh, whistleblowers, you have to differentiate what they directly saw and heard and worked on from their speculation. Okay. That's, that's the, been the problem with that situation and, and I why I don't comment a lot because okay. I, like I, I recently interviewed a, a Navy, a jet pilot who had chased one of these. And then he went off the reservation as it were. I mean, he goes way, he went way over his skis uh, and then began to provide speculative information that he's really not qualified to talk about. Uh, I see. So I think you have to, with all of these, you have to look at, go back, and it is what I try to put out there. What did you, working at Nellis Air Force Base or Area 51, specifically see, touch, handle, hear, et cetera, and then cut them off? And sure. The reason for that is that once they have an experience like that, they start Googling on the internet <laughs> and talking to other people. And it's like, you know, a rumor of a rumor of a rumor and a speculation on the theory of the universe and how technology that he saw work. And the next yeah. thing you know, you have this whole uh, thing that's out of control. So I just tell people, you know, I, I'm very clinical about this. I'm a doctor I'm taking a history from people. You, you, you want to stick to just the facts, ma'am, you know, and what did you actually see? And so that that's the only thing. No, I have no doubt that Bob Lazar actually did see one of these ET vehicles. Mm. Um, and uh, he was only there a few weeks. I, I don't think he was read into the level of operational detail to the extent he may have been given information. Some of it may have been information about the physics of it. Some of it may have been disinformation. So that if he did defect early, which he did, he came out, that he would put out unwittingly false. Yeah, I see. some false information. You have to understand yes. how counterintelligent these guys are very good at what they do. Mm -hmm. frankly. So this is why you have to be, um, I'm always very open-minded, but skeptical. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And I mean, yeah, that's a very, very good point. And I mean, one that I'm sure people are going to be coming into, uh, to hear with that, with that mentality. And mm -hmm. Uh, you, you touched on this because he, he may not have been read into, let's say, all of the stuff that was going on. And I've seen a lecture you gave. I cannot remember where it was exactly. Maybe Boulder, uh, Colorado, I think. And it, you, you touched on some stuff that was dealing with advanced physics, let's say. Like that there is, for this to be real, for all of this stuff to, 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 to have happened and for anti-gravitic technology to exist in our world, there has to be a clear separation between what's being taught in school what mainstream uh, media and what the mainstream physics taught is and what I guess we'd have to say real physics is because right. if it's possible, then that would make it real in, in quotation mark. So how has that happened? How come we can't just stumble onto this? Is there, is there, is there a money factor? Is it an intelligence factor? Do they just scoop these people up and just take them off to Area 51 or somewhere and how is that? How are we not getting any blend? Well, actually, we have, and you know, this is another part of the disclosure project. We're trying to bring out these technologies that uh, scientists have stumbled across for a century. I mean, let's not forget P. Townsend Brown, whose work became the foundation of the Rand Corporation think tank. He was using in 1920s very high voltage fields around crystalline materials, and they would levitate, they would float, and the that experiment was reproduced in Germany by the Kolosky frost experiment in, I think, 20, 1928 or 29. We're talking 100 years ago, man. So the laws of the universe are universal. And it can be discovered by someone from another star system or by humans. And unfortunately, what happens because of the threat those that physics provides to oil, gas, coal, nuclear power, public utilities, petrodollar, you know, it's, it's in a huge, you talk about a disruptive technology. I mean, people think these computers were disruptive because we don't have royal typewriters anymore, or cars were disrupted because we don't have horse and buggies. Multiply that times a million with this science. So 
it threatens the people who are in the cat bird seat of power. That's what it's about. And so, you know, the, the, a very mainstream organization, you can look this up. We have it in our film, uh, Unacknowledged. We call the American Federation of Scientists did a study of patents and they found that over 5,100 patents, many of them dealing with this energy question and innovations had been seized under what are called NSOs, national security orders, and just taken from inventors in universities, private labs, what have you. So if, if you're working on something like this and you get one of these letters, a national security order, if you tell anyone about what you have, you're going to prison and you're being fined, I forget how much it is, millions of dollars. Wow. So this puts a wet blanket on the sort of innovations that have come. And so yes, there certainly there are covert projects that know the physics of this and are building things that are close to what ET Starcraft had, Interstellar. But if a man on the street or someone at MIT comes across this, they're going to get that. That's going to disappear into the black pit of Calcutta, my friend. Yeah. So we can prove that. And this is mainstream, huge science organization came out with this study. And I think it was 2010, about 12 years ago. And I'm going, yeah, I'm glad there. And I know I have a member of my team that we've interviewed is up on my, my YouTube channel who's a PhD physicist who was in the patent office and became a whistleblower because he saw them seizing these sort of breakthroughs in technology. He was in that department. And he says, what is this? This would save the world. <laughs> and so uh, one of the things we're trying to do is to do an open source, no patent, no intellectual property holdbacks, research and development effort on these technologies um, that we would basically live stream the lab. Now, to do that, you need tens of millions of dollars. You're not going to do that like you do a documentary film for a few hundred thousand. But, you know, that's what I ultimately think would work because as soon as you try to go the private intellectual property route or the patent route, the system is going to seize it. It's gone. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to do an open source like GitHub, you know, the software group and stuff. Right. Where they just yeah. do everything that's out there for free, open source. Uh, and I think that's really what we, the people around the world, have to gather our resources and figure out how to do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious as well, because there's so, with that being so much, like, uh, as you said, uh, energy, you know, propulsion, all sorts of stuff that, you know, can be, can be amplified by an understanding of this. Have you ever come across anything? I've never seen anything, because most of the time, the discussion is centered around propulsion, right? It would be amazing. Uh, I, as just a, a young guy who, you know, grew up on, you know, cool, whatever, science, science fiction novels and things like this, have you ever run across anything, number one, that's messing with time in some sort of form or function? Do they, do they mess with time? What is that? What have we found about time? I mean, it's, it's fairly clear to someone who's into meditation and things like that, that linear time is not, that's just not it. Something else is going on. And I know they're clearly that that's also mainstream physics, I understand, but Mm -hmm. Have you ever found anything like that? Are they messing with those sort of things uh, at all? Uh, they, they can. And, and there are certainly technologies that allow to see forward and backward in time. Very to what extent, though? Like, does this, to, what is that? Absolute precision. Wow. Okay. Um, and there are the classified technologies. The, the ETs have much more advanced versions. But as far as affecting the timeline, that's more difficult. But yes, you have, I'll, I'll give you a great case. Uh, right there in, in the United Kingdom back in the early 80s, there was a, a pyramid-shaped craft that landed. And the Ministry of Defense now has released this as a report after we you know, got to the bottom of it. And we have a few of the people, men who were there at this Air Force Base, Rendlesham Forest at Bentwaters Air Force Base. And that craft that landed was actually us from 500,000 years in the future coming back in the timeline to warn about these nuclear weapons and that if, if those get out of control, because this was a secret nuclear base that would have destabilized the world during the Cold War. And the ETs literally floated through this, this, this black onyx pyramid and communicated mentally, telepathically with the uh, officers that were right there, the senior officers, Air Force American, and told them this that we are your children's children's children mm. from half a million years in the future, but they were ETs. In other words, at some point, if we don't destroy the planet, we will become interstellar. 
And even our physical form will evolve and evolve and evolve over hundreds of thousands of years. But those were our half a million year in the future descendants that boom, snapped back. And for the purpose of saying, you're about to do, set up a sequence of things where we won't exist. You're great descendants. That's, so this is, I know, mind-blowing stuff. And that doesn't happen often, but it certainly can. Sure. And so I think people, yeah, you're dealing with what, what, what it's really called, to be specific. It's called trans-dimensional physics. So the physics that most uh, scientists at MIT or elsewhere would know quantum or what have Newtonian and quantum post-quantum. But we're dealing with physics that cross over in these other dimensions up to and including the science of consciousness. What is thought? Now, now this is where it gets back to the CE5 contact we're doing. The reason that works and the reason thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world are doing this and have had experiences is because the ET communication systems, you and I are using something at the speed of light. Theirs run at the speed of thought. So their electronic systems interface seamlessly, not with scattered thought, but a very deep meditative state where you intend and send it. That gets picked up like a laser beam, but it's what's a quanta of thought? What is thought? It is something. So if you're dealing with civilizations that whose technologies, not just their understanding, cross over into these other dimensions of visual thought. I mean, the mystics would have called it the astral universe or what have you, or the lucid dream state. Anybody have a lucid dream state where you're flying or you see something and it happens in the future and, and it happens, you, you know, you sort of precognitively see it. Not unusual. I met my wife, by the way, that way, 43 years ago. And so I think, um, I think we have to look at this uh, and, and think, well, what would happen if we went and showed Thomas Jefferson our cell phone, our smartphone? Well, it'd be sorcery. Now, what I'm saying sounds like magic to people who have been deliberately kept uninformed for 70 years. But I can tell you by 1956, everything I'm just telling you was known, which is why the intelligence community was so upset when I started teaching just general people in the public how to use consciousness in the meditative state. And then this what we call coherent thought sequencing. It's in the app, the CE5 contact app to see and then connect with ET craft and invite them to come. And not every time, but they do come. Right. And this they find very disruptive to their control freak nature, because I, we're basically telling the people of the world, you forget about your president, wherever you are, you, the people need to be the interface between humans, humanity, and these civilizations, because the military has mucked this up beyond recognition. And I call it a citizen's diplomacy effort. We call ourselves ourselves ambassadors to the universe. And, you know, it's not an official program. It's something that's grassroots. But you know what? I mean, you look African-American. I am. Uh, my dad was yeah. half Cherokee. I'm 5 16th native, although I don't look it. I look Scottish and Dutch. But, you know, I tell people, look, you know, you, it, and I was a child during the civil rights and a, a teenager in the civil rights, gay rights, women's rights. That didn't happen because the president said, we're now going to make everything equal justice for African-Americans. No, there was a guy named Martin Luther King and in India there was Gandhi. Right. And so we, the people have to do this. I mean, I think it's a huge mistake for people to give up their power on something that's important to the buffoonery of people in government, frankly. Um, because they're either not going to do anything about this because they're scared or they're corrupt and they don't want to do it. So I think that the, the, the everyday person like I am, I, I, I'm a doctor, but I grew up very, very poor in the South. In fact, I had an African-American girlfriend and her father I've heard this story yeah. for the post office. And I went, wow, they're so wealthy. I mean, a letter carrier for the post office. We were like in awe. How wealthy. <laughs> That's how poor I was. Yeah. Um, but I just tell people, this is something everyone can do. And I, by the way, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I grew up very poor. Um, but I'm not ashamed of anything, frankly. I mean, you just be who you are. Right. But I think that that's why people have to think, why are, why are we doing this whole CE5 contact? By the way, we're doing a conference April 8th, 9th, and 10th out in the desert of uh, Arizona. And it's going to be webinar. So people who want to join us can join us. And the last night, we're going to be out under the stars on Native American land, and which I love because the Native peoples of America 
even worse than African Americans in terms of how they were treated right. and, and whatnot. And my, my grandmother, Cherokee, Trail of Tears, horrible. And so I said, well, you know, maybe we can do some healing <laughs> energy there for that, that sort of Holocaust for Native people. Um, but it's going to be beautiful because on that Sunday night, each night we're going to do this sort of meditation and CE5 contact protocol uh, between eight and 10. But the last night on Sunday, we're going to ask, you know, all the people who can join us and we're going to have internet link out there in the desert so that people can join us in this four hour from 8 p.m. Pacific time to um, midnight, which I know ain't great for Europeans, but <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it'll be great. <laughs> it'll be an experience. Yeah. And it's an experiment to see what happens when thousands of people go into a meditative state to affect change. And the studies that have been done at Princeton and elsewhere show that the, the field consciousness that we can tap into this deep aspect of ourselves, that's universal, that when people do that and then intend something to happen on a machine, it can register it, what they're called random number generators. But when like two people that love each other do it, it's exponential. Imagine thousands of people unified with a positive purpose do it. Maybe we can change Effect the world. Change. And, and it's funny because you, you, you mentioned that experiment and we've had uh, Dr. Dean Radin uh, on uh, the podcast before to talk. Oh about, yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to talk about, scientists. exactly. Yeah, and so to talk yeah. about that, but I, I, I would, and you, you just touched a little bit about this and, and I wanted to get more out of this, you know, written down, but the fact that you're, you're stating that we as the people are giving up power uh, in, you know, in relinquishing our ability to affect the world a lot of it has to do, at least in my view, the fact that much of what you said, and even uh, this right here, it's hard for people to, to put a grasp on the power that they truly do hold and have within them to affect right. change and to affect the world around them, especially with, like you said, focused thought, uh, you know, being at peace and in a meditative state, you know, all the things that have happened to you happen. You're, you're, there's some sort of calmness that, that surrounds you first, and then then you feel you know, you have this ability. It's not in this beta state uh, uh, that things like this are happening. So it, what have you found and what could you touch on for somebody who's just curious and, and wanting to tap into this? I mean, obviously they can, they can get into the app, but if you wanted to give them a taste of what they're missing out on by learning to meditate and tend and, and what is that, how, how and why, you know? You know, I always tell people, everyone, we all make everything too complicated. And I, you know, you and I are speaking right now, we're thousands of miles apart, but you're awake and I'm awake. Now just subtract everything else, mm -hmm. subtract the room, subtract our individuality, subtract your, uh, you know, ego selves. There's, you're left with just this field of consciousness. And what, what Erwin Schrodinger said in 1908, who was the father of quantum physics and particle wave theory, he said the total number of minds in the universe is one. It's a singularity. So, you know, the native people thought it was very odd that people from Europe thought they were separate from the earth, the stars and each other. But many cultures, it's by the experience of that spiritual state. And I, I use that, you know, the conscious spiritual state as opposed to organized religion, which ends up being the opposite, unfortunately. But that state of, of consciousness in mind, when you're very quiet, you realize you are all beings and all things. And so it's not just a philosophical point of view. It's an experience when you practice meditation, go deep. Now, what good does that do? Well, that changes everything in your life because you not only become more calm and centered and powerful, but you also can affect the world in a positive way, in amazing ways, because you're now in touch with that elemental foundation of being, of conscious life. And it, it has this huge effect. Uh, even the animals, if you're out meditating, they'll get quiet and come around. We've had whole herds of bulls when we're out in the country come over and, and just kneel down and meditate with us. It was really very beautiful, like Siddhartha. But I mean, they, they, this is a real effect of the conscious field when humans get coherent. And they've also done studies that people's IQs go up when they're in a deep meditative state. Uh, there are more connections amongst the neurons and the, the science of this is very strong about how powerful that meditative state is and blood pressure is normalized. And then when a group of people are doing it, this was studied years ago, 
because before I was a medical doctor, I became a meditation teacher mm -hmm. back in 1974 and whatnot. Um, and went all over the world setting up meditation centers and you know, like people like Louise Hay of Hay House were students of mine and whatnot. But what I found is that when they, they did these studies where there'd be a groups of people who had meditated. So if you had, and this is a movie that's called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind that's on Amazon and elsewhere you can see it. We, we cite this that when about 1% of a population does this, 99%, 1%. So if you're in a town of 200,000 people, it's 2,000 people who meditate, it causes a field effect, a positive change in everyone else. They don't even know they're there. Crime rates go down, emergency room visits go down, um, coherence, peace, everything. So it's very powerful. And so this has been studied scientifically, both in the social scientists, but also in the laboratory. And I tell people it's very beneficial to you individually but it's very beneficial to the world. Mm -hmm. Now it needs to be beneficial interstellar because we're not alone in the universe. So that's sort of the reach of what we're doing. And interestingly, you and I are both humans and that we're different from different backgrounds, but imagine the diversity there is out there between of species. Course. Yeah. Well, what's going to be the foundation of us not getting into war with each other? I mean, in this world we're still fighting one religion over another one ethnicity over another ukraine versus russia black versus white gay versus straight all this nonsense well we're going to have to find something much deeper within us to transcend that and heal and i think it's this deep uh beautiful field of state of consciousness and spirit that's a singularity it's the oneness and that also applies to making contact those civilizations are way more developed socially, spiritually, technologically than we are. And they're wanting to interface with people who understand what the foundation of that relationship is. And it isn't because we're from the same planet, because we're not, or the same IQ or the same emotional or cultural or what have you. It's got to be something more profound. And I think that's what, what it is. I think they're interested in humans doing CE5 contact who get the fact that this universal field of consciousness, that it truly is universal, that's the foundation of our relationship. And in, in a peaceful, enlightened world, that would be the foundation of our relationships on this earth as well. And uh, it, it, it confuses me, of course, yeah, when we can't quite get that. And uh, throughout the, the course of all human history, um, we've seen conflict over a large you know, a large time. I, I don't know your thoughts. I've never seen you necessarily speak too much about history. I'm always curious if, if there are, or if there was a civilization that, that got it. Now, you know, we, we, we are under the pretense that uh, over the course of these, say, 2,000, whatever, 3,000 years or so, that we have become evolved, we're, we're, we're becoming more evolved because of our technological mm -hmm. advancements, et cetera. And of course, we seem to be distancing ourselves from nature, which doesn't appear to be a good thing. Um, at all, at least in my estimation. And uh, so I, I'm curious if you think in the past, was there a civilization that, that kind of got it and uh, that we know of, you know, and I'm not necessarily leaning towards something that of Plato's Atlantis or any anything like that, but you know, is there, was there a pocket of society that, that put this at the core and in, instead yeah, of- I think there have been. Okay. I think there have been. Okay. Um, you know, the, the mythical Shambhala kingdom. Okay. Uh, up in the Himalayas, I think actually did exist. I think there were other uh, civilizations that came, but they were the problem that at that, that, that time they were isolated. Now we're global. So this has to be an interplanetary and global uh, leap forward into an enlightened, civilized world. And I, I'd say that the other thing about science and technology is that those, that's fine. I'm a scientist but you have to balance it with the rest. And what, what happened because of all the superstitions and the witch hunts and the excesses of religions, science rejected all things conscious and spiritual, which was throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So what I think we have to evolve is not only the science of consciousness, but the integration of a more comprehensive worldview and paradigm where we view the material cosmos and science uh, integrated 
not exclusive from this understanding of, of the field of consciousness that we're all uh, emanating from and that all space time matter is supported at that level of consciousness. And it's like, a you know, the noetic sciences, you know, Dean Radin's work with them. I, the founder, uh, mm -hmm. astronaut Edgar Mitchell was someone I, uh, guided through this issue. Mm -hmm. He was six man to walk on the moon. Um, and I presented to the board of noetic sciences about this. And, and really what this is, is that the whole creation is like this conscious cosmic hologram that's interconnected. Now in physics, they call this entangled or entanglement. And uh, Einstein called it the spooky effect where the same particle could be in two places at once and all kinds of things like this. But the ultimate level of connectedness is in the state of pure universal consciousness that every human being and every ET, if they're conscious, can experience in, in the meditative state. And eventually not just meditative, all the time. Sure. So, I, you know, and I found that athletes and a lot of high performance people, and I've done this in my career, uh, who meditate more can become very calm and it's difficult and can visualize the outcome. And really great athletes also visualize what they're doing, but that's the power of the mind. So I always tell people like I work out a lot and I'm, you know, I do a lot of sports, even at my age, um, I like press 900 pounds. I love the gym, That's right. mountain biking, yeah. and surfing, and hiking, and, um, love doing that. Teach my grandkids how to surf. And, but, um, but I'm kind of a freak for a grandfather anyway, but, um, yeah, <laughs> they call me Papa, but it's, it's really cool because, you know, you, you put your consciousness into it and amazing things can happen, uh, when you're also just doing something physical. Uh, you know, the nurses would always say that if I got incredibly still calm, it was a really bad trauma case. Mm -hmm. And that person was about to, we we're about to lose mm -hmm. them. So I have found that when things are very difficult, you get very centered and calm and not start throwing scalpels or whatever, like some doctors do. And, and, and the outcome is always much better. So even, you know, whatever kind of line of work you're in, this meditative state uh, is really edifying. It really benefits you. And the people around you too, yeah. for that matter. Yeah, and uh, you know, I can't remember uh, his his name just off the top of my head, but we had a large and long discussion about the flow state, which you can you find in sports all over. A whole lot of times, you find it with the extreme sport athletes, but you do find it within soccer, right. basketball, football, mm -hmm. the, the performance of Michael Jordan all the time, and where, oh, where these guys are accessing absolutely. some something that is is possible for everyone to access, but that. Perhaps we're not honing it, and I get it. It's not like we don't get it here. I've seen an iPhone before. I know how fun it is to keep scrolling. I understand. But uh, that being said, you know the benefits, and in, in, in it's it's kind of tough because, like you said, when you guys do have this, uh, you know these these experiences when you go out to try and, and, and make contact. Okay, yes. maybe sometimes it doesn't happen. Maybe it's like that, and and that's the same thing with meditation. If you sit down one day and hope that it's going to just snap your, it, it may. You know, uh, there are cases of this. It, it certainly can. Uh, but you might need to keep going uh, for, for a little bit. And it, it's, that, it's that long, persistent journey that you have uh, while becoming this person who meditates more. Because I've said this on many other podcasts, and, and it's great because you, you work out a lot. You, you do this, you know, but there seems to be some sort of upper limit, right? You, 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 at the current time, you, you, you bench this. With meditation, I don't see any drop off. It just gets, no. it's exponential. You just keep getting better. It, there's no end to it. I don't know if that's, yeah. if you agree, but yeah. that's what I've found. I do. It, it, well, there are certain hallmarks, but it's infinite. Right. And, and that's the thing, the field, this field consciousness is infinite beyond space and time, but the, the abilities that go with it and, and the ancient Sanskrit Vedas, they were called uh, cities, cities right. F I D D H I S. But things such as levitation, precognition, lucid dreaming, materialization, dematerialization. You hear like these uh, very enlightened masters could do uh, some of the miracles that Christ did. That actually is within the purview, the capability of every human. And so the, the level of progression is, is amazing. Interestingly, everything that you see that these ET craft and those beings can do technologically can also be done just in consciousness, right. levitation, right. 
Mm -hmm. all of it. Mm -hmm. Think about mm -hmm. it. So it's interesting, inner and outer, it, they begin to sort of that, that demarcation that we're very obsessed with in the West doesn't exist. It's all an integrated uh, quantum hologram that's awake and conscious, uh, meaning that everything is connected to everything else. And we always look at everything externally as out there in our inner life. Uh, and there's this like line. But it, it, there's actually this integration of the consciousness deep within us, and not just every wayward thought, but, you know, and the totality of the cosmos and the creation. I'm certain that interstellar civilizations have to have mastered that because think about it, to go from Andromeda, we have a photo of an ET from the Andromeda galaxy that appeared at Joshua Tree with us, and he's floating in the desert waving at us. It's an amazing mm -hmm. photo, actual photo. And that being, if it, it, and we learned that he was from the Andromeda galaxy, it's two and a half million light years from here. Well, that's the distance the speed of light goes for two and a half million years at 186,000 miles a second. So at the speed of light, well, you and I are talking at the speed of light right now, electromagnetic systems. It would take two and a half million years to make a call and say, hey, how you doing back home? And another two and a half million years to get an answer back. It's five million years. So all these extraterrestrial civilizations have had to master what's called in physics non-locality and entanglement, both in terms of travel, but also communications. And the best way to do it with communications are electromagnetic devices that interface with thought. So it's instant. There's no time lag because it's beyond space time, beyond the, the limits of space time, right. which interestingly can be done technologically but it can also be done innately through the meditative state and the practices. So I was offered one of these devices by a spook uh, back in the 90s who, who invented it in 1956. That was an electronic system that actuated this kind of remote viewing and consciousness. And I said, wow. no, thanks. We'll just stick natural because they get me killed to have it. Sure. But those were developed in the intelligence community. Back in the 50s. Back in the 50s? Back in the 50s. Okay, yeah. so I didn't, I, I understood what you meant, what we were saying, obviously, about the, the technology as far as the electromagnetic, uh, or sorry, the anti-gravitic technology in the 50s. I didn't know that stuff like this, because that was actually, and I know we're, we're, we're just about to finish up here, but that's one of my most interesting questions to me. I mean, I'm a guy like you, I, I've never seen a, a, a UFO. I haven't seen anything like that, but I have had interesting, um, you know, I was having OBE, experiences without knowing what they were at 16 and stuff. Right. I didn't know what that was. There was no, Me too. Yeah, okay. Too. So, you know, and it, I stumbled onto some books and had to read like, what is this thing? It doesn't feel like a dream. It's not a dream. Something else is different. I'm awake, you know? And so I went to that, but I, I was always curious if there was technology that would trigger that. And if that was something that the government has, because you could probably, I don't know what you could do with it, it's, it's, but I figured, well, they, they use it to spy. They use it for you know, yeah. gathering intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, no, I know, I know a lot of people who work in those programs and uh, there's no question that they have. Now, you, you, you know, there are all kinds of things out called uh, remote sure. you know, people from the CIA come forward. Yes. Russell Targ, it's in one of our documentaries, who is a PhD laser physicist with Lockheed, who then got pulled into the CIA program for using consciousness to spy on the Soviet right. Union or whatever. Uh, and they were very effective, by the way. He was not read into or briefed on the projects that were the electromagnetic interfaces, uh -huh. which predated his involvement by almost 20 years. Um, you know, I have been because I've worked with a whole range of people from uh, various agencies who, who dealt with these. So this is the other problem. It's sort of sad to see my children and grandchildren go into an educational system where in reality, the biggest breakthroughs of the last hundred years, no one is being taught. And, and so there is also a, a brain drain uh, where, you know, we're, we've sort of reached a certain point and it's been stopped in terms of, and they're tinkering around the edges with digital and IT and some biotech, but the big breakthroughs that should have happened about the time I was born in the mid fifties have been forestalled. Um, out of just greed, corruption, fear, control. And really it's about control. They want to be able to control the masses. These, this knowledge that we're talking about, both in consciousness, but as the science of consciousness, but also these physical sciences and technologies, would they would lose their centralized control over the uh -huh. planet. Right. 
And that's what these guys are about. It's all about control, power. And uh, this is the ultra, ultimate liberation movement in a sense, um, because people don't realize it. Whether, you know, if you're in America, you're just in a wealthier version of their plantation than if you live in the Congo. But everyone's under the thumb of this sort of a global uh, system that wants to keep these advances from out of everyday use because the centralized power they have would devolve to every village and every town would have be self-sufficient, totally self-sufficient. Well, they don't want that. <laughs> they want to be able to have, you know, maintain this kind of rigid control free. And I actually had an admiral say to my team, uh, when we were asking him to help us bring some of these technologies out, he says, look, I just want to retire from this command and go fishing in Wyoming. And he says, my main responsibility, and he was in charge of CONUS, Continental United States Security, all of it. He said, my main concern is the status quo of the world's energy supply. That's our main purpose, meaning oil, gas, coal, right. nuclear. Um, and I'm going, yeah, I know, because that's hundreds of trillions of dollars. But that's, the people have to realize the game that's played here and that it, it's not going to change from the top down. It's going to change from the grassroots up. And yeah, because that's one of these things is we're always expecting, and I don't know what necessarily, and I think I may have heard you speak about what you thought might have happened with the first disclosure project, you know, where maybe at least on some level had some sort of hope like, all right, well, we're going to grunt all these guys together and this is going to be clear. And then, you know, like president's going to see it and this person is going to see it. And we're all just going to be like, all right, this charade, uh, let's just, let's just cut it out. And, you know, here you are still plugging along doing, doing the work as you've realized, you know, it's got to come from the masses and there's got to be enough people to have a, a good understanding of that, to push it, you know, to push it real forward. Uh, yep, exactly. And also remember nine 11 happened four months after the national true. press conference, yeah. which was no, by the way, no coincidence. Yeah. So I won't say. Uh, yeah. Well, um, uh, if I, I'll just say, I have someone on my team who is in, the vice president's office. Uh -huh, Cheney, I see. And, and in advance, in advance of 9-11, saw the plans for it. Wow. Well, I knew that there was already talk of, obviously it was a drill, there was this going on and there was that, and I, you know, and there's, there's that whole. Yeah, we, we allowed it. Look, well, you can stand systems down so you allow something like uh -huh. that to happen if it serves a strategic purpose. And then, you know, uh, we were talking about the cosmic hoax uh -huh. of an alien sure. threat, which is total nonsense. By the way, just before sure. we leave, if these civilizations were hostile and a threat to us, there are hundreds of thousands of years technologically beyond uh, nuclear weapons. It, we, we would, it would have been over, over, <laughs> my friend, like in a nanosecond, the instant we detonated the first atomic bomb. Because by the way, when you detonate those things, it not only puts out an electromagnetic pulse, it puts out waveforms that are called scalar longitudinal that disrupt extraterrestrial communications and travel. That's why after the Trinity site, the first atomic bomb went off, the, the skies over the Southwestern United States were filled with these mm -hmm. ET craft because it's very disruptive. Uh, and that's not talked about either. I mean, you know, how we're viewed, humanity is viewed as an existential threat in the cosmos. So everyone has it backwards. <laughs> you wanna know where the threat is, go look in the mirror. It's, it's, it's the current state of human society. Um, and, and part of it is that, you know, our, our technology has exceeded our social and spiritual development, which is why I think it all has to happen together in an integrated way. Conscious development, spiritual development with social development and technological development, because if it's, it's if it's not integrated, the technologies get way ahead of people's spiritual and social development. Next thing you know, we have a new generation of weapons based on ET technologies that are much worse than nuclear weapons. Right. So where does this end? It has to end in the human heart and mind. Yeah, and that level of balance is what's needed. I mean, and obviously, like we've already mentioned there, I mean, that level of balance and that level of calm, serene, your best choices come from there. They do not come from you being in a completely jittered, anxiety-filled state. Right. Yeah, fear. fear, fear, of course. Well, they want to keep people afraid all the time. They want you to be afraid of COVID. Right. They want you to be afraid of this. They want Well, and remember, Dick Cheney and his henchmen literally concocted in, for the Iraq war, false intelligence. They sent, you know, Colin Powell up to the UN holding up vials of stuff 
And people may not remember this, but that's how we got into this debacle, the Iraq war that blew up the whole Middle East. It was all based on false intelligence. Well, that's what's happening right now in the UFO issue. They have people going into the White House up on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill, to the Pentagon, to people who don't know about these projects, telling them these lies, that this is some threat. And they don't say, wink, wink, the things that are threatening our airspace ours. are ours. They're from the Lockheed Skunk Works in Northrop Grumman. My uncle worked, my mom's oldest brother worked on, uh, as an aerospace engineer on the lunar module, landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong in 1969. So, you know, I know a little bit about these aerospace companies, frankly, because he was there as a career guy. But what I tell people is that, you know, though all those systems that are in place are actually running over the, the, the interests of the people and even the government, because the corporate world and these covert military and intelligence services have become a hybrid entity that's walked off. And that's what Eisenhower was trying to warn about when he said, beware the military industrial complex. I always tell people that wasn't Abby Hoffman or some hippie <laughs> in the 60s. You know, this is like a five-star general Republican, yeah. of all things, saying this. So I said, think about it. What was he talking about? Well, it yeah. was this issue. Uh, I, I mean, I would love to keep going. I don't want to take too much of your time. This has been incredible. It's going to give a whole lot of people a whole ton of stuff to dig into, which, of course, like we said, if you were watching this on YouTube, then, of course, it's in the description box. As always, if you're listening to this, it's in the show notes. Uh, once again, throw us the dates for your... Um, this, this event that's coming up here, it's in April, did you say 8th or 9th? Yeah, eight, it's April okay. 8th. That's a Friday, uh, 9th okay. and 10th, three uh, and days. So you can actually participate in uh, the, the whole weekend or just that one night on Sunday. If you want to learn a whole lot, you can just webinar in for the whole thing. And, and if you can't see it live, it'll be saved. You can gotcha. see it at whatever time gotcha. you're on in Australia or uh -huh. Croatia or okay. wherever you are. Okay. Awesome. Um, we definitely gonna have to come back on sometime to have another discussion about all this stuff. And whenever you're putting out, I, I mean, is there another documentary coming? Sorry to throw that out there. I'm working on a two. Okay. Position. All right. Awesome. Yeah. One, one's going to be on this whole lost century. The other one's going to be on the actual CE5 okay. experience. And we're going to, we get some, we're getting some people who can do really great, um, um, you know, special mm. effects and animation to show what it, sure. what these experiences really are. Uh, mixed in with our actual photos of ETs and okay. craft that have come up to the sites. So um, it, I think that's going to be awesome. a fun one to do. It's going to be more experiential. Uh, the other one's a very heavy lift. It probably won't come out mm -hmm. this year. That That's a hundred year sort of tour de force of all these technologies and sciences that exist, but also a look at what the world will be like mm -hmm. after these are brought out for peaceful use. Uh, in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, wow. 100 years, wow. 1,000 years. Because the world that we have right here is a faint shadow of what it should be because of the secrecy. I mean, imagine if there was no pollution, poverty, uh, energy was free, uh, manufacturing costs mm -hmm. would plummet, uh, transportation would be immediate. Um, you'd have no surface right. roads on the planet. You'd just be floating above. Um, sounds like <laughs> the Jetsons. And by the way, by the Jetsons were done, we already had those technologies. <laughs> yeah, so we could have already had it. It wouldn't have been, it wasn't just fiction. Yeah. Oh, and I'd be remiss. I, I, I absolutely have to sit here in Croatia with a book on Tesla right in front of me. Were we on Great. that path? Just was that path? It was just yes. ripped out. What happened yeah. to the documents when he died? Did the FBI see so yeah, what, you know, I'm, I'm just curious. Well, I can prove. I, I, got, a, I got a document from the uh, Department of Defense here in D.C. Mm -hmm. at the Pentagon demanding that J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI turn over the secret papers of Nikola Tesla that they right. stole. So the instant Nikola Tesla died, they moved in with a team, took all of his mm. secret papers. And interestingly, a reporter once asked Albert Einstein, what's it like being a genius? He says, I wouldn't know, ask Nikola <laughs> Tesla. Yeah. He was the, he was genuinely the, guy. Mm -hmm. the great genius of the yeah. 20th century. But he died very alone, bitter, because all the things he was discovering, you know, like J.P. Morgan turned to him and said, if I can't put a meter on it, meaning a gas meter, it ain't going to come out. So his brilliant inventions and breakthroughs, what he called the infinite energy field, it's now called zero point. Those all, those are yet to be fulfilled. Wow. Um, people knowing for the things they allowed to come out, 
but his real genius and real breakthroughs a hundred years ago were right. we don't have yet. Yeah. We're working on okay. it. Well, awesome. Listen, we uh, love to see it. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak and uh, good you. luck with, with everything in the ongoing journey. We'll obviously be, be following. So, so thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Great meeting yeah, all right. you. Guys, we will see you later. Uh,